Conspiracy. No evidence of Japanese collaboration with Trotsky has been discovered. It is entirely outside the former Soviet Union. There are a number of possible explanations for this. One, Trotsky never collaborated with the Japanese. All the Soviet evidence is fabricated. That's the most common assumption. Two, if Trotsky did collaborate, the, fo the following possibilities exist. Non-Soviet evidence was destroyed, perhaps during the war. Uh, evidence did exist, but has been purged, you know, otherwise destroyed deliberately. Nobody has looked for such evidence. It's another possibility. Or, fourthly, there never was an archive, any archival or written evidence of this collaboration. In fact, conspiratorial information of this kind is typically not written down at all. I believe that the single most likely reason, that is reason that all the evidence we have is Soviet evidence either wholly or partly, is simply that no one should expect a conspiracy like this to be documented anywhere, ever, much less in archives. The demands of secrecy and security require that such information be exchanged only by word of mouth. The purpose of a conspiracy is, of course, to leave no evidence behind. So, a perfect conspiracy would leave no evidence. That would not mean there was no conspiracy. Evidence might in fact exist, but remain unnoticed until an investigator, armed with the proper hypothesis, came along to look for that evidence. That's me. This is what happened in the case of Peter Ward and the Alvarez hypothesis, and in my case. So, if no evidence of a conspiracy could be found, that in itself would not mean that no, no conspiracy had taken place. It would mean that the hypothesis, there was a conspiracy, would not be confirmed. We would have to set it aside until and unless such evidence were discovered. Now, we do know of conspiracies that left no evidence behind, but that did take place because they succeeded. A Soviet example is the conspiracy among members of the Presidium, formerly the Politburo, to remove and or murder Lavrente Beria on June 26, 1953. No evidence of the conspiracy prior to Beria's arrest or murder has ever been found. Likewise, a conspiracy that failed or was abandoned might also leave no evidence. An example of a conspiracy that is now undeniable, but that was universally dismissed and ridiculed for more than 40 years is the, that of the existence of the bloc of oppositions in the Soviet Union during the 1930s. The bloc that involved Trotsky and the Trotskyists, Zinoviev, Kamenev, and their supporters, Bukharin and the Wrights, and others. Leon Trotsky vehemently and repeatedly denied that such a bloc existed or could exist. And this bloc, of course, was uh, first it was, was prominent, a prominent part of the accusations and the testimony at all three of the Moscow trials, right? There were 6, 37, 38. Trotsky denied that there was such a block. He proclaimed it was a stupid lie by Stalin. Then Khrushchev's men, then Gorbachev's men, also denied that it existed. They claimed that their researchers had scoured the Soviet archives and found no trace of such a conspiracy and no trace of such a block. Yet we know this block of oppositionists did exist because evidence of its existence was found in the Harvard Trotsky archive in 1980. Trotsky and his son Leon Sedov exchanged letters about it, about the block. In 1985, Arch Getty showed that the Trotsky archive at Harvard had been purged of incriminating evidence. It was purged imperfectly, so evidence of the block and of other lies by Trotsky were still there. Getty and Pierre Brouet found it. Pierre Brouet was the leading Trotskyist scholar in the world at that time, and remained so until his death in 2006. Isaac Deutscher, who had privileged access to this otherwise closed archive for the third volume of his three-volume biography of Trotsky, and Jan von Heyenort, Trotsky's secretary, and the person who maintained the archive for Trotsky <coughs> and then cataloged it for Harvard, both of them denied that the block existed. Like Trotsky and Setov, Deutscher and Van Heyenort lied. We know they lied because the evidence is in the archive, right? And they used it. Let us suppose for a minute that the purging of the Trotsky archive 
which Getty demonstrated, took place, had been more thorough, and that the written evidence of this block's existence had been removed too. Then we would have only the Moscow trial testimony, the prosecutor's charges, and the defendant's confessions. Everyone would still think today that the charges and confessions about the block were falsifications, like Trotsky said, Khrushchev said, Gorbachev said, and all the anti-communists said. But of course they would still be true. The block would still have existed. The destruction of the evidence that an event took place did not mean that the, events did not, the event did not take place. Right? You with me here? The destruction of the evidence that an event took place does not mean the event didn't take place. The existence of the block was discovered by Bruet more than 35 years ago, 1980. Yet to this day, most people on the left believe that the confessions made by the defendants at the Moscow trials were false, that the trials were frameups. Why do we believe this? I, I don't, but I say we because I don't want to limit my remarks just to Trotskyists, or just to official anti-communists, you know. Uh, it goes far beyond that. The stance taken by virtual, virtually all historians of the Soviet Union is that the Moscow trials were frame-ups. The accused were innocent, forced to confess to crimes they never committed. All right? You're all familiar with that, right? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm talking about. But there has never been any evidence at all that the Moscow trials were frame-ups. The more evidence we get, bit by bit, from the former Soviet, archi from the former Soviet archives, plus from other sources like the Harvard Trotsky archive, for example, the more evidence we get, the more evidence we have that the Moscow trials were in fact genuine, meaning that the accused and their confessions at trial confirmed what they wanted to say, not necessarily what was true. We know that some of them lied to the prosecution for their own reasons. I go into that in my book, too. But the evidence we have is that they chose what to lie about. The NKVD didn't force them to lie. All evidence in all historical investigation, not just Soviet Union, not just the Moscow trials, but all historical investigation, requires critical scrutiny. No evidence ever speaks for itself. I am putting the finishing touches on the first of two books about Trotsky during the 1930s. I devote about 30% of this first volume, the one that I expect to finish before the end of this year, published before the end of this year, to a detailed verification of the Moscow trial testimony. During the 1980s, Pierre Bruet discovered that Trotsky had deliberately lied about the block and also about other questions of fact that arose during the Moscow trials. However, since that time, no one, Pierre Bruet himself included, has ever attempted to draw the conclusions from this fact. Why? Bruet lacked objectivity. Bruet was a Trotskyist. He was out to defend Trotsky. And that means he was not out to discover the truth. You can't have it both ways. Bruet was unwilling to formulate the hypothesis that Trotsky may have lied in other cases, and then set about searching to see whether the evidence of such lies exists. Until now, to my knowledge, no one has formulated the hypothesis that Trotsky may have deliberately lied about other matters in addition to the block and those other falsifications that Bruet discovered. And that might be a very fruitful hypothesis. For if Trotsky lied over and over again about the block, as we know he did, an obvious question is, okay, he lied about that. What else did he lie about? I have done this. And I have found that evidence of further significant lies by Trotsky does indeed exist. Trotsky lied about a lot of matters concerning the Soviet Union during the 1930s. I discussed these lies, both those that Bruet and Getty discovered, and those that I have discovered myself in my forthcoming book. Okay, we can now prove that Trotsky lied about many things concerning the Soviet Union about the Moscow trials, about the people he was in touch with. These lies alone have important implications for our understanding of what Trotsky was doing and writing during the 1930s. Of course, Trotsky himself knew 
that much of what he wrote about the Soviet Union during the 1930s was false. He knew that he was lying, of course. Moreover, once Trotsky had lied about something or some event one time, he had to keep on lying about it forever. Right? In other words, once he had denied in 1936 that there was a block, he had to continue to lie about it forever, right? You can't say, oh, this year there's a block, and next year, well, there wasn't a block, and then the next year there was one. That meant that Trotsky had to fabricate versions of events consistent with his lies and then pretend that he was trying to understand and to explain what was going on inside the Soviet Union. In reality, what he was doing was consciously fabricating a false version of what was happening in the Soviet Union that would fit his lies, be consistent with them. Here are a few examples, briefly. One, the murder of Sergei Kirov on December 1st, 1934. Trotsky pretended to predict that his own name would be mentioned in the investigation. And sure enough, it was mentioned. So Trotsky claimed that the Kirov murder investigation was really directed at him, Trotsky, and at his followers, because Stalin was so afraid of Trotsky's movement. But in reality, Trotsky had to expect that his name would come up in the investigation, why? Because Kirov had been murdered by clandestine supporters of Zinoviev. And the Zinovievites were in that block with the Trotskyists. And they had already named their own leaders, Zinoviev and Kamenev. That we know from the Trotsky archive at Harvard, right? From Trotsky's and Sedov's own documents. So why wouldn't they already, since they've already named Zinoviev and Kamenev, why wouldn't the Zinovievists also name Trotsky, who was not directly their leader? They probably would. So Trotsky could safely predict that they would. And when the investigators did raise Trotsky's name, Trotsky could claim that the charge was so preposterous and Stalin so clumsy, so transparent, that he, Trotsky, could predict that his name would come up and therefore claim the charge was obviously false. And that's what he did. Also, Trotsky would appear brilliant, able to figure all this out in advance. This was important for maintaining his movement, which was structured around a kind of cult of Trotsky. Another example. During the second Moscow trial, this is uh, January 1937, Karl Radek, one of the most famous defendants and a longtime Trotskyist, stated that he had received a letter from Trotsky at the end of February or the beginning of March 1932. Trotsky proclaimed loudly and repeatedly in print, that he had no, he had had no contact with Trotsky since 1928, when Roddick, I'm sorry, he had had no contact with Roddick since 1928, when Roddick had capitulated to Stalin. Trotsky pointed out that he had attacked Roddick in print, and that Roddick had attacked him in print in the Soviet press. So Trotsky claimed that this proved that Roddick had been forced to invent the story about the letter, compelled to lie, and that in turn this showed that all the Moscow trials were framed. Yet now, thanks to the Trotsky archive at Harvard, we know that Trotsky did indeed send a letter to Radek. What's more, he mailed it at exactly the time, the same time that Radek had stated in the 1937 trial, in the February beginning of March. Once again, Trotsky was lying. Just, to, just like in the case of the block of Trotskyists and other oppositions, it, oppositionists, once again, some Moscow trial testimony can be independently proven to be truthful. In 1937, Leon Trotsky successfully organized the Dewey Commission hearings to clear his name and to spread to the world his, Trotsky's, con contention that the first and second Moscow trials had been a frame-up. John Dewey and the other commission members held hearings in Mexico, where Trotsky was living at the time, right? With uh, Diego Rivera. And they got testimony from Leon Sedov and others in Paris, because Sedov was living in Paris. The transcript of the Mexico hearings was published in a lengthy book. You probably have it here someplace, right? Dewey Commission hearings. Mm -hmm. A year after the hearings, that is to say in 1938, the Dewey Commission published its report with the conclusion, not guilty, that's the title of the book. They declared Trotsky not guilty. For almost 80 years now, 
everybody, almost, has been saying that this report proves that Leon Trotsky was innocent and that the Moscow trials were a frame-up. You read this all the time. But now we know that Trotsky repeatedly uh, told the Dewey Commission all the lies that he had been telling in his writings. Of course, he had to do this. Once you start telling a lie, you have to stick to the lies you've invented. The Dewey Commission accepted Trotsky's testimony at face value. There were other serious problems with the Dewey Commission, too. Their report is full of logical fallacies. During the hearings, important questions were never followed up. The Commission members were all anti-communists. Some were pro-Trotsky to begin with. It was a stacked deck of members, since some who were not pro-Trotsky quit. Someone's coming in, so I'm going to pause for a second.